Hello and welcome to the Design Make Play Show. I'm your host, Zachary Anderson. For those of you tuning in for the first time, here on Design Make Play, we seek to engage makers through challenges and discussion, to highlight maker projects, and of course, to learn about the STEAM-based curriculum, which includes science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. If you like anything that you see here today, make sure to check us out at zenmakerlab.com, where we offer a variety of programs through our Zen Maker Academy. You can also go to shop.zenmakerlab.com for a variety of PPE equipment that we've been selling, uh, as we do have our MDEL, our Medical Device Establishment License. And we've posted recently uh, some of the project kits that we offer um, in our ZMA programs online on the shop as well. Throughout this live stream, I will be uh, trying to interact with you guys as much as possible, proposing challenges and asking you questions. Um, so if you have any responses, uh, if you want to try out some of these challenges, you can message uh, your responses to us using the at zenmakerlab.com hashtag, or sorry, at zenmakerlab hashtag design make play to Instagram or Twitter, and I will actively be checking Twitter throughout the live stream. Okay, so that covers the first stuff that we wanted to cover today. Why don't we go right into our math challenge in just a second here. So, um, yeah, let's go right into the math challenge. Okay, so uh, this is called the North Point problem, the North Point problem, or sorry, endpoint, <laughs> endpoint problem. Uh, so this is the endpoint problem. Uh, in this problem, we have five glasses, okay? And we want these five glasses, okay, to look like this. Look like this. So here we've got three full glasses on the left and two empty glasses on the right. And we want to move one cup. We are allowed to pick up one cup, one cup, and we want to move one cup such that the three, the one on the outermost side, the one in the center, and the one on the other outermost side are full, and the other two here are empty. So this is your problem for today. What actions need to be taken moving only one cup? Such that, such that only these three cups are full and these two are left empty, okay? So that is your challenge for today. Think about it, see if you can figure out what it is. And of course, uh, I will be making a Twitter post and you guys can respond, guys and gals, uh, to me there. Um, and uh, for those of you who get it right, uh, we'll send out some sort of prize. Um, but thank you so much for checking this out. Next up, we've got our Design Make Play segments. I hope you're ready. Hello and welcome to the Design Make Play Show. I'm Sarah and I'm an illustrator and designer at Zen Maker Lab. Today we will cover sketching and the ideation process. So let's get started. Hi, so I want to show you guys two finished projects that I created at the final stage um, because today we're going to talk about the initial stage of um, coming up with ideas and, and the sketching part. But these are two examples um, that I'm showing you of final pieces of what you could actually end up creating. So this is one project I did and it was for Canadian Postage Stamp for school. And then the next one is a poster book ad that I created for a children's storybook. So as you can see, they're both flushed out at the final stages. But for today's purposes, I'm going to show you the ideation initial stage of how these um, ideas came to be. Okay, so now I want to tell you guys about what is ideation and what is sketching. So ideation is coming up with thoughts, ideas, solutions, and then taking those ideas and putting them into a sketchbook just like this. And this is my sketchbook that I use for pretty much everything. It's like my um, idea barf book uh, or diary. And I just, I just get everything down um, that I want to write down so that I don't forget anything. So yeah. And how inspiration can hit. It can happen in many different ways. For me personally, when I'm trying to get inspired, I go into nature. Some people will talk to friends or even inspiration can hit you 
um, in the most surprising places. It can strike you like lightning. It's really weird. It can happen in the shower. It can happen in your sleep. And that's why you always want to have a sketchbook right beside you. Um, and the more things that you do and places you go, things you see in your life, that's where the inspiration comes from. So you just want to do as many ideas as you can when you have your sketchbook. So personally for me, I like to draw a lot of little images, I like to sketch a lot of doodles, and just draw different concepts um, to make sure that I don't have all my ideas stuck up in here, I can get them on paper. But everyone has their certain technique of um, how they like to draw, but that's my style. And if we can think of our ideas almost like an input-output machine, the input being we're taking all our thoughts and knowledge and things we've done and experienced and we're taking that into our brain and the output is that we're coming up with super cool ideas and solutions for different things, which is awesome. And the cool thing about ideas is that they can be super small to super big and have a different impact. Um, and just like iPhones, for example, that was created with the same process as this. Somebody was coming up with ideas in their sketchbook and came out with a super cool project. So you, the ideas are infinite. You guys can do anything you want if you set your mind to it. So I'm just going to end with showing you guys the first two projects in the beginning and the final execution stage of what they looked like. So here is the first example again of the postage stamp design that I made. And then this is the second design that I did for a poster book ad for the children's book design. And so really what I want you to take out of this is that your ideas can go from simple little sketches that just look like whatever you want, doesn't have to be pretty, and you can take those to the full final stage of flushing them out into something really cool. I hope you guys learned something new about ideation and sketching. Ultimately, what I hope you took out from creating ideas in a sketchbook is that it doesn't matter how ugly or what your technique is for, for just drawing them out. The main thing is you want to create as many ideas as you can using a sketchbook, which can be really helpful. So I hope you learned something in today's segment, and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now. Hello guys and welcome to this make segment. I'm your host, Zachary Anderson, and luck does have it. I just got my order in from DigiKey. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at what we got down here. Oh, beautiful. Hmm. You know, this PCB looks a little bare. Why don't we dress it up a little? So we're gonna jump right in to learning about some of the principles in soldering. So if you guys were watching last video, you know that we talked about the MP3 player and a little bit of the components. Well, in this video, we're gonna be looking at how to solder correctly and how to solder these components onto a PCB. So first off, what is a PCB? Well, a PCB is a printed circuit board. So if you've ever worked with a breadboard before, you've probably seen a big mess of wires and all these crazy things. Well, a PCB is a printed circuit board. So all the wires on this PCB are actually little copper traces inside the board that connect each pinhole to another. So a printed circuit board makes those connections inside the actual board. And if you guys remember the system visual from last video, you can think of some of the traces here as being representative of the lines that actually connected those blocks in that system visual. So this is the piece that we're actually going to be mounting all of our components onto. So let's have a quick look at some of those components. So these are the pieces that we'll be soldering down to the board. And you can see we've got a speaker, USB, Arduino, some tactile switches or push buttons, and our DFP mini player, which is the driver for the speaker. We also have a port to plug the USB port into, a resistor, which is one kilo ohm, we have a 470 microfarad capacitor rated for 10 volts. We have uh, a 15, two 15 pin female connectors and two eight pin female connectors. 
And we also have this little JS2 plug that's supposed to plug in to our speaker, just like that, beautiful. And finally, of course, we've got our PCB. So now that we've covered some of the components, let's take a look at the equipment that we'll be using. So first up, we have our soldering iron. And today I'm using a very special one. I'm using a Hakko FX901. This is a portable soldering iron that actually runs off of just some alkaline batteries. And I thought this was absolutely fascinating. I'm really, really excited to test this thing out uh, to see if it actually works. Because most of the soldering irons I've worked with have an actual power station. But this guy is saying, hey, I can use AA batteries. And so I thought, that's interesting. Let's try that out. We're also gonna need some solder. So this is the material that will actually be melting to connect all our components together. It's a conductive metal, primarily made out of tin uh, with a little bit of other components in there as well. We've got some electrical tape and I'm gonna be using this uh, to tape down some of our components as we solder them. We've also got a pair of wire cutters um, or wire strippers rather, but uh, we'll be using this to cut some of the wires that are sticking out at the end. And finally, we've got our holder, our clamp for our PCB board. So let's go ahead and let's get soldered. So we've got our one kilo ohm resistor. And I'm just gonna thread it between these two holes right here. Just like that. And then underneath, I'm gonna pull those legs out. Okay, and you can see that legs hanging off the end. And if I turn this board around, you would see, if I flip it over like this, you can see the legs that are sticking out there. So I've just bent those legs out and that's gonna hold the resistor into the PCB board, okay? Into the PCB P board. I'm gonna flip that back over now, back the way that it was. And let's add our next component, which is going to be the capacitor. So for the resistor, this is an example of an unpolarized component. So you can connect it either way. But the capacitor is polarized. It's got a positive and a negative side. So it's really important that we connect this the right way around. Now, the capacitor that's most important here is the one that connects to the speaker. And so that's gonna be the capacitor that's down here, all right, down here on the board. So I'm gonna take a look at this capacitor and I'm gonna look for the stripe that's got the negative, the negative sign, and that's telling me that this is the negative terminal. So the shorter terminal of your capacitor will always be the negative terminal and the longer terminal of your capacitor will always be the positive terminal. Okay, and if you get lost, make sure to just take a look on your capacitor. It'll show you which is which by that band. And you can also see the value there is 47, uh, 470 microfarads. So let's go ahead and we're gonna plug this now doo -doo -doo -doo, into the board just like that. And then of course, again, I'm gonna fold the lakes out underneath. So I've put in my passive components, they're ready for soldering. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna turn on my soldering iron. Now this thing's pretty nifty. Uh, it's got a button here. I'm just gonna slide that up and we're gonna see the little red LED come on. And that's gonna tell me that this is heating up, okay? This soldering iron is now heating up. Now, a little bit about soldering iron safety. Make sure that you never leave a soldering iron on when you walk away. Before you walk away from a bench or a soldering iron, you need to make sure that it's turned off. But this guy's gonna heat up. And once it's heated up, we are gonna be able to melt a little bit of solder on the tip. So I'm gonna grab my solder here. And let's go ahead and let's grab a little bit, a little bit of solder. And I'm just gonna hold this to the tip of my soldering iron until the point that it starts to melt. So let's go ahead and let's do that. Oh my gosh, that works so well. I don't know how these guys did this. This is phenomenal. So what we can do next is I'm gonna hold the tip of my soldering iron to the point that I wanna solder. And I'm gonna bring the solder to that point. And I'm just gonna melt a little bit of solder onto that contact, okay? And what's really important is I wanna make sure that I'm touching the wire and the pad at the same time. I wanna make sure that I'm touching the wire and the pad at the same time. So I'm gonna hold that down against the wire and the pad. And I'm just gonna add a little bit of solder there. There we go. Now these solder pads for these passive components are really, really small, but usually they're a little bit bigger a little bit easier to manage. So that one's there. And then finally, this one here. Perfect. All right. So I've got those done. I'm gonna put the lid back on and turn off the soldering iron. And we're gonna move to the next step. Okay, so on to the next step. 
what we're gonna do is we are going to now put down some of the push buttons. Okay, so I've got my push buttons here, as you can see. And I'm gonna be connecting these push buttons now onto my PCB. And one of the reasons that I'm using the push buttons first is because once I add these FEM connectors, it's gonna be hard to reach in there. So next, I'm gonna add my tactile switches, my push buttons. And these are gonna go into each of the slots that say button on this side. So let's go ahead and let's pop those on. So we got the first one, second one, our third one, and our fourth one. Beautiful. And what's important is that these stay really flush. They stay really flat against the PCB. So that can be kind of hard. And actually, if we flip this thing over, you might see some of them fall out. Luckily, they didn't, but sometimes they do. So one trick that I find really handy is to have some masking tape. And we can actually use this masking tape to hold down the buttons while we solder them on the other side. So that's what I'm gonna do next. Uh, so we're gonna skip ahead a little bit of me soldering uh, or taping these down and soldering them together until the next part. So see you guys soon. So we just finished soldering this guy and whew, that was tiring, but we're almost done. But I made a mistake. Ah. So what did I do wrong? Well, if we look here really closely, you'll see that these two pads have been soldered together. These two pads have been soldered together. So if this happens to you, don't freak out. There's something really easy that we can do to resolve this problem. We're gonna break that solder bridge. We're gonna break that solder bridge. And that could be a new dance move that you practice when you listen to your song. So let's go ahead and let us break this solder piece. So all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take my soldering iron and run it through just like that. Hope you guys saw, we'll do it again. But I just run it through and that's all I need to do. I just take my soldering iron, I run it through that bridge and it's just gonna break apart. So that's fantastic. There's one more step that we really have to do. I'm gonna close this now because I'm done soldering and it's really important that I always close this off is I'm gonna cut these excess wires just like this. So I'm gonna cut that one and that one. And one more thing that I want you guys to note, guys and gals, let's take a look, a close up on one of these solder pads and you're gonna see that there's a, a nice crown, right? And that's what we want. We want that nice cone shape, okay? That nice cone shape on each solder pad. We want that nice cone shape. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's plug in the rest of our components and then we'll be done. Isn't that fantastic? Look at that. Beautiful. So I'm going to take my DFP mini player and I'm going to plug it in here in that slot. Wow, perfect. Then I've got my Arduino microcontroller and I'm going to plug it into this slot. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Fantastic. And then I'm going to grab my speaker and I'm going to plug it into this spot here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, let's see, which way does that go? Perfect. I'm having some difficulties plugging this in. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Okay, so that's plugged in there. And then finally, we've got our USB. And yeah, I got that the right way around. Why do we always plug it in the wrong way around? Perfect, there we go. There is our completed system. Oh my gosh. So let's go ahead and let's listen to that Ariana Grande. So what we're gonna do next uh, in the next video is we're gonna be looking at actually powering this thing and programming it. So I hope you guys are excited and I'll see you next time. So we learned a lot about soldering and how to put things together and solder them correctly. Your challenge for this video is I want you guys to find some other item in your house maybe that contains the same elements as this solder. So this solder contain is made of what metal? And can you find an item in your house that is made of the same metal? If you do, make sure to send it to us at zenmakerlab.com, hashtag design make play.
Hi everyone, it's Coach Greg here in the Play Zone. We have our intro to table tennis this week and we've covered the basics of table tennis, the grip and the posture and the stance. Uh, that was last session, now what are we working on? We're going to work on forehand, backhand drives, forehand, backhand push and the footwork that comes with it and the spin you can put on the ball. So Greg, we're going to do four basic strokes today. Forehand, backhand drive, forehand, backhand push. How do we do that? We start with playing cross. Cross table is forehand to forehand. We're also going to learn how to do down the line, which is a shorter distance. So I'm going to be repositioning a player after that. Forehand position, steady, neutral hand in front of you. Turning your hips and your racket in about your hip side over here and then sending the ball with the force forward. There is a very minimal spin on the ball. Mm -hmm. What you do, you are adding speed to the ball. So we're creating force on the ball. Okay, ready? Yeah. Forehand to forehand and our goal is to ten. So don't yeah. hit the ball too hard. Try to keep it on the table. Think about turning the hips and sending the ball forward with your body. You don't want the arm just to be doing the work like this. Okay? okay. Yeah. We are leading the hand with our body. That's in Sounds table good. tennis, yeah. body leads your hand. So okay. that is our ball. So one, two, three, lean forward, lean forward, four, five. Okay, so you're starting to stand up like this. Okay. Again, lean forward. Keep the ball over. I have a one, two. What we are looking to do, it's called, we're trying to find a rhythm, okay? okay? We're trying to hit the same way. So you don't hit one ball faster, one ball slower. Yeah. We're trying to find a rhythm like in a song. Boom, okay. boom, boom, boom. Tempo, rhythm. timing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Lean forward, lean forward, you're too tall. And when you become too tall, the ball is too tall, so get lower, net level, net level. That was good. So we did our Better goal time. of 10. Now so we're going to try to do backhand okay. drive. Okay. okay. So you're going to be now standing in the left corner, left hip to the left corner. Um, left hip here. Left foot forward, right foot. So your chest is facing the table. Remember, okay. chest to the table. So you're not standing like this because my chest is facing the wall and now I right. can play. Yeah. So chest to the ball. So you okay. don't want to be here, you no. want to be Again, here. the ball goes in front of me. Got it. Forehead, yeah. when the ball is here, my chest turns to the mm -hmm. ball. So chest to the table, good. Okay. Now lean forward again. We're sending the ball with very minimal spin. Okay. So we're sending the ball with Less force. body turn, less body turn. There is no body turn in backhand. So okay. it's very minimal. It's the movement of, this is like a labor okay. in, in your backhand. It's like throwing a frisbee. Imagine yeah. you are throwing a frisbee, okay, on your backhand. You're sending okay. the ball with the speed forward, not mm -hmm. much spin. So one, so Greg, don't go sideways. Okay. Yeah. Try to go forward in okay. front of you. One, okay, now angle the racket more, so it actually is a little bit lower, okay. One, yep, it's a very bouncy racket. One, don't lift it, go forward. Oh. Remember throwing a frisbee. Yeah. One, two. Think about the speed forward. Speed okay. forward, send it forward. One, two. Okay, ah. use the rocket angle, you're keeping it too open. Close okay. it up. One, two. Okay, watch the finger, remember? Yeah. Finger on the line with the bottom of the rubber. Two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So what do we do when the ball is here? This is outside of our belly button. We play back and in front of the belly button. Okay. So we can move a little bit in this position if I'm very steady and wide legs. Yeah. Or you just move and then move back. Okay. Okay. You have enough time to do that. One, two, three, four. Five, six, send the ball forward, seven, forward, eight, nine, ten. Okay, good. So
So I'm sending the ball forward, you're just blocking me. So try yeah. to put the same speed okay. on the ball, okay? One more try. One, two, three, four, five. Now we have a rhythm. Seven, eight, nine. That was really good. Better. How does it feel? Feels better. Feels Have good, right? The right technique is everything. Yeah, okay. So that was forehand, backhand drive. It's okay. called drive because it sends the ball forward with some kind of a uh, mm -hmm. speed and, and in, with a drive. Okay. So now we're going to learn under spin. It's called, the stroke is called push, okay? Okay. So when you play drive, you hit the ball in the center of the ball. So now we'll try to hit the ball under the center. Opening the face Yes. Of the and racket. then what we need to do, we need to almost carry the ball forward. Okay, so okay. try not to hit the ball, okay? okay? So let's do forward first, forehand. Okay, again. So very soft, softly. One, come closer. Every time, come closer to the ball. Try not to go too far. One. Again, ready position, important, one, good. You're hitting the ball too hard, so okay. and you are not carrying it forward. See how my body goes yeah. with, with the racket, with, yeah, nice, good, softly, soft. Otherwise you are, if I give you a lot of number spin, you put yeah. it in a net because my effect yeah. bounces off your racket. Again, gently. Carry the ball, come closer to the ball, come closer, okay, don't hit it. You are too open with your racket and then the ball bounces. So okay. try to get under the center of the ball. Once you do that, again, your body will carry the ball forward. Nice. Now you have a good feeling. Good. Yeah, see, can you say that the sound is softer yeah. than when you are hitting? Oops. It's nice more, yeah, I feel pushed. I yeah. feel like my stroke is extending. So instead even, of... even the sound is different. It's softer sound. This is very hard, yeah. hard chunk, which means that's a very little spin. This means a lot of spin. Now we're going to do backhand. Okay. So we're going to go a little bit closer to the backhand side. Okay, so try not to lift the yeah. ball. Get under the ball and then carry it forwards. Yeah, get under the center of the ball. Okay, again. Try not to hit the ball in the center, get under the ball. Yeah. Nice. Again, one okay. more. Let's try to do 10. Carry the ball with your body. Again, remember, don't stand sideways, the chest okay. to the ball. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, I okay. think you're doing really good. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, that was, that was great. We actually got the heart rate going and Learned, to, learned some new skills. So uh, tell us a little bit about the, the strokes. Yeah, so we learned today basics of the forehand back and drive, forehand back and push, and what is the difference between them. One is sent with the force, so one applies the speed, and the other one applies the combination of the friction and this uh, force, which is the top spin, under spin. All right, we'll see you in the next session. were three amazing segments uh, really well done and now we're gonna ask you guys some questions guys and gals about those 
segment. So I hope you're you're paying attention. I hope you're ready. Uh, we're we've got some prizes again that we'll send out uh, for those of you who guess correctly um, or just get them right. You don't have to guess. Hopefully you're using your head. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's dive right into it. Of course, these answers or these questions have been posted to Twitter already. So you can go ahead there if you'd like to reply Twitter or Instagram. So first up, we've got our design segment. And for design, our question is, What's ideation? What is ideation? What is ideation? Okay, so if you remember that design segment, hmm, hmm, ideation, what is it? It's probably defined. Next up, uh, from the make segment, what is a PCB? What does that stand for? Um, so, uh, go ahead, you can, you can look, you can even look that one up. That one's not too difficult, I don't think. Uh, what is a PCB? What is a PCB? And finally, for play, what are forehand and backhand drive in table tennis? What are forehand and backhand drive in table tennis? Now, again, I am checking Twitter actively, so as, uh, as you guys respond, I can reply back. So go ahead and uh, you can write your answers on, the, on Twitter or on Instagram, and uh, we'll get back to you with a chance to win some 3D printed prize. But those are your three questions. So again, ideation, what is it? PCB, what is it? And uh, what, doo -doo -doo -doo, uh, what are forehand and backhand drive in table tennis? I don't think I even know that. Uh, so uh, I will have to go back and rewatch those sec sections. Uh, but those are our uh, questions. Thank you guys so much. Next up, we're gonna be moving into our engineering tributes. I'm super, super excited uh, for this one today. It's a little bit different. And let's see if you can tell the difference. Um, but thanks so much, don't go anywhere, as we'll be right back. Welcome to our engineering tribute. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and let's dive right into our tribute for the day. And this tribute is going to Donna Strickland. Uh, so who is Donna Strickland and what did she do? Well, first, uh, let's go ahead and let's take a dive. So first up, uh, Donna Strickland won the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, and she won it for uh, the work that she did towards chirp pulse amplification. Now, chirp pulse amplification uh, is a method by which we can increase the energy, amplify the energy of laser beams. Yeah, so she is like a laser engineer scientist, which is like the coolest thing ever. Uh, if you think about like Superman and his vaporizing rays that shoot out of his eyes, uh, that's what she's been working on basically is like these laser rays um, to heat stuff up and we have a laser cutter even here in the lab that I was just messing around with yesterday uh, to configure. So that was one reason that I wanted to talk about Donna Strickland because she had put some really good work into uh, chirp pulse amplification and we're going to take a little bit of a look at how that really works uh, and why. Um, but uh, yeah, it's used by a lot of the high-powered lasers in research right now. And one in particular is the Vulcan laser at the Rutherford uh, Appleton Laboratory. Ruffleton Appleton Laboratory. And you can see a picture of the, of the laser there. Yeah, so really cool. Uh, it lets us uh, power up things, but, but how does it really work? Um, so the way it works is uh, there's a short laser pulse and uh, you know that light, white light contains a variety of other, of other lights, right? Um, it's a full spectrum. So there's red, white, or sorry, uh, red, uh, yellow, blue, green, all these, all these different colors combine together to make white light. Well, what we can do is we can fire those into some sort of gradient and separate them out. So we're stretching out this pulse, okay? So this, there used to be this little light pulse that was like this, and we just stretched it out. And as we do that, if, you, if you've if you taken the uh, Zen Maker Lab animation course, you probably know about squash and stretch. Um, but when you take a physical object and you pull it out to the sides, right? We're stretching the sides. The top normally comes down. 
And that's kind of what's happening here. That's, that's that intuition that we have. So when we stretch these pulses out, the, the amplitude of the overall pulse comes down as we stretch this out. And when we do that, uh, it puts those littler pieces, that, that lower amplitude, into a range that we can actually increase again through an amplifier. So that's what's happening here. So we're stretching out that pulse, we're putting it through an amplifier, which is just gonna make it bigger. Okay, it's just going to up the size. And then we put it back, we scrunch it back into that little pulse again. And now that pulse has been crazy, crazy increased. And this was really, really important for getting some really high energy lasers for all kinds of physics to do with, um, with atoms and particles, uh, molecules. So um, the work that Donna Strickland had done, it was really, really influential. Um, and that's why she had won the Nobel Prize. It was really important for a lot of the instruments that went into further research. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Donna Strickland. Absolutely fantastic. So a little bit more about her. Uh, she is Canadian. She's a Canadian scientist. Uh, she went to McMaster to get her uh, bachelor's degree in engineering physics in 1981. Uh, she then moved on to Rochester, uh, where she specialized in optics and got her PhD. And then she was awarded a uh, professorship at Waterloo University here in Canada. So, um, yeah, she's a Canadian scientist through and through. Um, she was also, when she was studying at the time in 1981, only three of 25 women in her in her engineering physics class. So uh, just to give you a little bit of a perspective on how things have, have changed. But uh, she has done a fantastic job, really, really smart person. Um, so that's why we wanted to give her a shout out today. Uh, and of course, I love lasers. So thank you so much, Don Strickland, for all that you've done with lasers. I really hope that one day I get to operate one as powerful as the ones that uh, you've been working with. So that covers our engineering tribute. Let's go ahead and dive in now to our maker highlights. Wow. So uh, this segment is my favorite segment of the show where we get to highlight projects made by students here in ZMA or submitted by uh, makers from wherever. We, we accept all projects here at Zed Maker Lab. And uh, today, I've got three really cool projects that I'm gonna show you. So first up, we've got Daniel Skeleton. So Daniel Skeleton uh, is a project that was worked on by Daniel. He was one of the students in our program. And Daniel loved uh, Dungeons and Dragons. He loved Dungeons and Dragons. He thought they were absolutely fantastic. And so uh, we thought, why not, um, why not do some stuff with regards to what he was doing in D&D? And so he's actually created and modeled some of his D&D figures. So I thought that was really, really cool. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the D&D figures that he had created. Let's take a look at some of the D&D figures he had created. Wow, check this out. Absolutely fantastic. So uh, let's take a look, Daniel, at some of the things that you did. So first off, um, this is all made from the basic shape. So he's using just basic shapes here. And you can see that first he had to make the make this uh, the rib cage, right? The rib cage. So the bones that protect our lungs and some of our organs. And it looks like the way that we did that was, doo -doo -doo, I think we used a donut. Uh, or a torus, right? So that's what it looks like Daniel's used here. And he's, he's even got this piece, which is the base piece, um, to make sure that his pieces sit flat, right? If we were, if we were, remember when you're designing things, when you're making things, if they have a round bottom, they're not gonna sit flat, they're gonna kind of wobble. Um, so he was, he was very careful to make sure that they had a nice proper base. He's added some arms here using some spheres and some cylinders, really well done. Um, for some perspective, Daniel's about 11. Uh, so he is, he is a little bit, a little bit more advanced. Um, let's see. And he's, he's taken, he's taken, uh, some programs with us before. Ah, wow. Fantastic. So you can see here, uh, he's actually cutting out, um, all at once that, that center column, that center column. That's the, that's, uh, supposed to be between the, the ribs, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that's, that's good. That's gonna add some, that's gonna make it look a little bit more realistic, right? Um, and we've got this sort of spinal column at the back. 
Um, this is really important because you need something to actually connect all these pieces together, right? Um, our, uh, our muscles sort of and cartilage holds all our bones uh, together, um, but uh, for, for, this, for this guy, we need uh, some sort of solid structure, right? He's not gonna have something kind of flexible in between the joints and things uh, in his spine to sort of hold things together. And so uh, he needs like sort of one long structured bone going up the spinal column. Uh, but this is really well done. And uh, the, the donuts here, I can tell that was done using the duplication tool, which I'm a really big fan of because it uh, saves you a lot of time. And here, again, like for the, for the skull, it looks like he did the skull first. And he started with some spheres that he cut out for the eyes and uh, some uh, rectangle or uh, elongated cubes that are been deformed into sort of rectangular shapes um, to cut out for the, for, the, for the teeth. And yeah, so really well done. Really one, well done, Daniel. Uh, fantastic work. And I hope that uh, you had a fantastic D&D game. So next up, next up, that was Daniel's skeleton. Now we've got Daniel's pizza. Now Daniel's pizza is a little bit different. It's a little bit different in that uh, this is made by a different Daniel, different Daniel. Um, so let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and take a look at this pizza. Let's go ahead and take a look at this pizza. Okay, so uh, this pizza here has got, wow, check it out. Uh, it's a very big pizza. Uh, and this was again done by a different Daniel. Um, but look at the size of this pizza. This looks absolutely delicious. I want a slice of this pizza. Um, that has been a theme on the show now for a little while here is uh, pizza because pizza is absolutely delicious. If you remember yesterday, we had uh, Bob's, I think it was Bob's pizza, pizza slice. So just following up on that pizza, I thought Daniel here did a fantastic job, different Daniel, um, but it's pepperoni. It's one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, so good job, Daniel. And you've got three big pizzas there. You've got the ginormous pizza and then two little pizzas. Um, so really well done. And we wanted to give you a little shout out uh, as it's sort of a pizza theme right now we've got going on. Okay, so that covers our first two. And of course, our last is uh, Connor and Owen's mask strap. So these, these two had been working uh, in some of our uh, ZMA Academy programs. They've taken 3D printing and electronics, and they'd really taken a shine to 3D printing and have been looking at some projects that they can do in their community to help out. And uh, they've been printing mask straps as well. So you remember yesterday we highlighted a soap project that they had been doing. Well, they're also doing uh, mask straps. So I thought that was a really cool way to help out in their community. So uh, that covers our maker highlights. I hope that you have enjoyed. Uh, if, you're, if your uh, project got highlighted, make sure to send it out to your friends and go, hey, check this out. Um, next up, we're gonna have an interview with a special guest, so uh, stay tuned.
Hello and welcome to our interview for the day. I'm very excited to introduce uh, Emily F uh, Furman. Furman? Yes? Correct. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Emily is a uh, data, data analyst uh, in the past and now she's a project manager. She made this really cool, really cool map um, using uh, data, um, data uh, analytic, uh, it's a data analytic visual. Um, and uh, she's now a project manager and a uh, lecturer at Columbia University. So welcome, welcome Emily. Uh, thanks so much for being on our show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you about that, um, the, uh, what is it here? The theory of everything uh, mapped, it's a really cool and interactive um, uh, tool. Uh, and um, I wanted to know what inspired that project and what tools uh, you use for that project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before, before working on that project, I'd been uh, doing some graphics work for Quanta Magazine um, and working closely with the team there. Uh, and for some time, the team had uh, wanted a way to make it clear to, to readers of the magazine what the whole uh, world of, of physics looked like, uh, what all of the, um, what, what broad topics in it were currently being researched, being discussed, um, how, how those broad topics connected to each other um, and how different theories in, in that domain fit into different topics or connected different topics together. Um, so, so the goal there was really to give a picture of the field in a way that would be familiar to researchers who spend their their um, you know twenty four hours a day thinking in that space, uh, as well as folks who were who were newer to the space and wanted a overview and an introduction of um, how different topics fit together and and what was really uh, contained in it. So. Um, the goals for it were to be uh, visually appealing, uh, to be explorable, and to also connect to all of the articles in, that already existed in Quanta that would connect to those different pieces as well. So um, a way to invite viewers in uh, and to lead them to interesting, relevant things to read uh, as they were learning about different high-level topics. So. I used a data visualization library called d3.js um, to build it. It was a very custom build in that um, D3 is a JavaScript library that contains a lot of ready to go templates for common visualization types. So it's very easy to build a quick bar chart using this library or to generate um, a, a, a flow chart uh, that's interactive or to build um, a quick scatter plot if you want hover effects. So, so there are lots of tools already um, that come with the library to help coders get up and running pretty quickly visualizing data. Um, but because this was such a specific project um, that didn't, uh, that was trying to visualize something that hadn't really been visualized before, coming up with the right method to do it required building out a very custom, um, a custom visualization type. So what I did, um, if you've seen a network diagram before, uh, D3 has functionality to help you generate those pretty quickly. So a network diagram, when I, when I use that term, I mean the kind of diagram where you see um, different circles or nodes in a, in a space, each node representing a data point with different links between them, representing connections between those nodes. Um, so what I did was take one network diagram and trace lines around it to create this kind of overlapping, bubbly uh, uh, chart. And then on top of that network diagram, layer another one to place uh, theories within given uh, given topics and connect those together as well. So um, I, I use the library in a in an unusual way, but um, to kind of achieve this this floaty, multi-dimensional, very layered view of an, a domain with a lot of overlapping uh, linked together regions. Um, 
Does, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, if, if, when, you, uh, when you run your mouse over it, it feels very organic too. Like I, I like it, it feels like it's alive. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a voting system in that application as well, right? For voting on which is the best. Um, yeah, there is. For those nodes, did you cluster those yourself or uh, did you use some sort of program to uh, like cluster those nodes together? Um, um, yeah. What, what happens um, when, I, I assume you're talking about the view when you can see the votes kind of lined up in a stack? Um, no, I mean, uh, for, the, for the, like, uh, when you go into a section, um, there are like different nodes mm -hmm. in that section. Um, so to define mm -hmm. the nodes that went into that section, right? You, you clustered them. Did you do that yourself or was there like a, was there a separate program that, that did that for you? Um, yeah, um, that's that's an interesting question, actually. So for uh, with the built in network functionality in D3, there are a lot of different physics variables you can control. Um, so if you picture uh, uh, a node or a circle with a bunch of lines coming out of it, linking to other circles, you can control how much gravity you want that node to have. So how much it pulls other nodes to it. Uh, you can control how, uh, what happens when you move your mouse over it. So like, does it jump away? Does it come towards you? Um, and what I did was for the second layer of the map, when um, I wanted to line up all of those smaller theories with a bigger topic was access the kind of center of gravity for the bigger topic and have the theories sort of use that as a reference point. So um, the second network diagram laid on top of the first would reference the kind of points of gravity in the underlying map to make sure they clustered around the right regions. Um, so it wasn't, I, I built on existing logic um, that was already available for, for customizing networks in the library. Very cool, very cool. Uh, it's an awesome tool. Uh, we'll make sure to post it. Uh, I'm gonna be posting it from the Zen Maker Lab account on Twitter. So I'd recommend our viewers check it out. It's very cool. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you interested in data visualization? Yeah, um, visualization to me has always been especially interesting because you can take something very regimented and formulaic like a spreadsheet and produce something um, really fantastical and and expressive and um, and unexpected often. So I think that from a practical standpoint, visualization can really reveal patterns in a data set that you can't see by just reading a spreadsheet or, or a, a, a table on its own. Um, and it's it's that power of being able to use a carefully defined graphical system to get the data to express things about itself that you you wouldn't be able to just discern um, in its raw format. So to me, that transformation process has always been re really interesting. Um, and I've particularly loved looking at how to build encoding systems so, so the graphical side of it, making data visual, how to look at those constraints and tweak them in ways that can produce really visually interesting visual output um, or uh, depending on the use case, informative visual output. Um, I think working with that graphic system has always been uh, just really interesting to me. Um, and it's had its roots. For me, one piece of it is uh, being a musician and having having read musical scores for much of my life, um, I think that the process of interpreting a very linear encoding system into into sound, translating it into sound with a broader shape and color, um, kind of led to that way of thinking being familiar and interesting for me. That's an interesting path. That's an interesting connection. So reading music sheets and being able to encode just like these little black black and white uh, images into, you know, that that's auditory sound that's so lovely is, sure. is something that inspired you. That's really mm -hmm. cool. Um, that's something that I've never thought about. Um, yeah, very interesting. Uh, what is a data visualization analyst? Like, what does that job entail? Like, if somebody wanted to be a data visualization analyst, what kinds of things would they have to know? What would the job mm -hmm. look like? 
Yeah, um, the job itself can take a number of different forms. So when I was in that role, that meant either creating very well designed charts for specific presentations or other kind of business materials for communicating to the team I was working on, as well as to clients, what was in a data set, what interesting insights there were uh, that, that others would need to know about. So um, it can focus very much on chart design, how to choose the right chart for the data you have, how to tweak the visual parameters of that chart to make sure that it communicates or it emphasizes what you want to come through. Um, but it can also mean on, on a flip side, creating more um, kind of artistic or expressive materials for marketing needs sometimes, or even interior decor. <laughs> uh, there are lots of different ways, um, kind of the generative art side, uh, if you're producing um, you know, a series of posters for a client who wants something eye-catching for their team to, to um, help them understand the data, data set about their own client base. Uh, there are a lot of different forms it can take, but the main task is focusing on translating data into compelling visuals, whether those visuals are meant to inform or entertain. Um, and skill-wise, the best things I've found are to really be able to be self-taught. Um, working in visualization requires needing to quickly pick up or put down a variety of tools many of which you might have no experience with. And the ability to, to do that, to quickly teach yourself new things, to use materials that you have um, to be adaptable and resourceful are, are really key, I think, to being, being successful. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, well put. I, I think, uh, yeah, I, and, I, and I, I imagine there are new tools coming out all the time that you have mm -hmm. to learn. And so Absolutely. Um, I guess being able to uh, be a learner of life and, and uh, be able to uh, learn on your own, right? Like a lot of people mm -hmm. make the argument that like, you know, school is a place where you learn to learn, right? And then yep. you go out into the world because you're always learning, right? So. Um, exactly. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, do you have any advice for young girls that are interested uh, in data visualization uh, or data analytics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my. So so I think this sounds this sounds kind of kind of maybe fun or unexpected, but um, I would highly recommend starting to build your own data sets about anything, um, whether it's uh, whether you look out the window and track the people who walk by and the direction they're going, or you. Um, start recording the, the weather and different variations on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think getting in the habit of constructing your own data sets and deciding what variables to measure um, and, and working with something that familiar uh, that, that you can explore on your own um, and, and that you understand is a really great place to start. It gets you in the data headspace. Um, it helps you understand different variable types um, in a very hands-on way and gives you great material to start exploring uh, your own creative visuals. Great. Well, thank you so much, Emily. Emily Furman, um, if, you, uh, if you liked what you see here today, she's got a website. We'll be posting that as well and the t uh, tool on uh, Twitter. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Emily. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, that covers our show for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Um, just so you know, we will be posting today's show, or sorry, yesterday's show on YouTube as well. So you can go ahead to youtube.com and check it out there. Thank you guys and gals so much for uh, tuning in. And uh, I hope you have a fantastic Wednesday and we'll see you tomorrow.